The Ministry of Secondary Education has developed a distance learning platform for students of secondary education in Cameroon. A series of lessons taught by qualified teachers for secondary school students. Under the stewardship of Professor Pauline Nalovalyonga, in collaboration with the Ministry of Posts and Telecommunications, CAMTEL, CRTV and UNESCO. We are introducing distance learning as another teaching and learning method which is different from the traditional classroom setting that you are all used to. In the distance education mode, you are not with the teacher in person, so take your time, relax, listen to the teacher, take down notes and visit the following links for any questions or answers to your questions. Take it in your stride. This is Cameroon's solution to COVID-19 and beyond. Professor Nalova Lyunga, Minister of Secondary Education. Welcome to our lesson for Upper State Science Biology. I am Balboya Tragic, your online biology teacher. Our lesson for today, we shall be looking at the mechanisms of asexual reproduction in animals. This is the plan that we shall follow throughout this lesson. After we look at the objectives of this lesson, we shall look at the previous knowledge, what we require, so that it should enhance our understanding of this lesson. We shall have a theoretical example of a real-life situation. We dive into the activities of the lesson proper, we will do some exercises, and we shall have an assignment to do later on. But before we proceed, with the plan of this lesson, it is important that we look at the assignment we have and see if we did it correctly. The assignment was as follows. We were asked to differentiate with examples between parthenogenesis and parthenocarpy. These are terms we have seen in the previous lesson and we are still going to see them again. In that assignment, the plausible response could have been as follows. When I say plausible, it implies that you could still do it otherwise, but the key facts would be as follows. For parthenogenesis, it occurs in some animals and mostly in vertebrates. In this process, the development is from an unfertilized egg, meaning that there is no fusion of gametes, and this could be haploid or diploid. And this is usually caused by the lack of males within a species. This process, however, can be induced maybe by harsh environmental conditions such as high temperature or ultraviolet radiations, or it could be natural. And the examples that we have which are common in our environment include the aphids, the drones in honeybees, we have snakes, we have shark, and we have some lizards. Not all lizards do undergo parthenogenesis. Here is an example of an organism that undergoes parthenogenesis, and this example is the honeybee. So we see that we have a diploid female bee, and this bee produces eggs by meiosis, implying that the eggs that are so formed will be haploid. Then, if there is no fertilization of these eggs, then each of these haploid eggs, which we call A and B, will develop into haploid male bees, and this is what we call the drones. Since these drones are haploid, they themselves will be sterile. They will not be able to produce gametes because they are not diploid. We are going to look further into these aspects as we proceed, because we shall be looking at the mechanism of asexual reproduction in animals. To continue, the other term, which was parthenocarpy, is similar to parthenogenesis, but for parthenocarpy, this is the development of fruits without pollination and fertilization. So, parthenogenesis takes place in animals, while parthen parthenocarpy takes place in plants. So, this occurs naturally, or it can be artificially induced by man. You can do as you like to obtain what you want. And the fruits which are formed from this uh, process 
they do not produce seeds. They may equally not produce flowers at all. And an example we have in our environment is the cucumber. We also have watermelon, implying that if you buy your cucumbers or watermelon and you slice them, you may see them having seeds, or you may not see them having seeds. And as a biology uh, student, you will be able to explain why some cucumbers will have seeds and why others may not have seeds, because it results from the way in which they were formed. Here are examples of those seedless uh, fruits of cucumber and the watermelon. So when you look here, you discover that this is the tissue. You can see the, the, the meristematic tissue here. The, there is no seed inside. So the ones that develop by normal sexual reproduction, you will see seeds located inside. So these ones result from Parthenon capi. Then, with this assignment already done, which is giving us a clue to our mechanisms, what then are the objectives that we shall try to achieve by the end of this lesson? We should be able to describe the mechanisms of asexual reproduction in at least two animals. And we should also be able to explain the causes and significance of asexual reproduction in animals. But what do we need to enhance this understanding? We should have some working knowledge or an understanding of the concept and type of asexual reproduction in animals. Because the assumption in this lesson is that we have this knowledge in our background. So we should not come back to it in the course of this lesson again. But how can this lesson help us in our life, everyday life? Here is a theoretical situation, and it's as follows. A zoo guard in Limbe caught a young female lizard from the rocky shore and decided to keep it in a cage. But after six months, this lizard laid four eggs, which later hatched into healthy young ones. He was perplexed that these eggs have hatched when there was no male counterpart of this lizard to have crossed it. So there was no mating. So he was perplexed and he was wondering what might have happened. So let's see how this our lesson is going to help us to explain how the eggs which were not fertilized could hatch and give rise to young lizards. From this example, what could be a scientific observation? It has been realized that unfertilized eggs of the lizard hatched, which is seemingly abnormal. Then, from there, what hypothesis could be drawn? In the absence of males, female lizards lay unfertilized eggs that can hatch to young lizards. That is a hypothesis. Let's see how true or false this hypothesis will be. In the course of this lesson, it is important that we have a review of this activity. And in this activity, we would like to recall or to reflect what actually may be going on in this diagram. This diagram, we see that this is a hydra. In this first hydra, we see a tiny bump which is growing and it continues to increase in size. You see that the growth now, it looks almost like the mother hydra. And once it has increased in this size, it actually falls off. Therefore, this other young hydra becomes an independent hydra. Therefore, what method of reproduction could this be? We had earlier seen that this is called budding. So this is budding in hydra. And from the assignment that we have just done, we will see that there is equally no involvement of gametes in this process. So this is an aspect of it. So we proceed and we see the detailed mechanism of how these processes go on. The various types that we have seen and which will still look further of asexual reproduction could include binary fission, like in amoeba, budding, like we have just seen in hydra, fragmentation, we have parthenogenesis, which we earlier talked on in our assignment. 
And with this and many more, what then could be the mechanism of this asexual reproduction? We mean that what actually happens? We have seen that it requires only one parent, like we saw with the hydra, and the offspring that is so produced is the exact copy of the parent. And when many of those offspring are produced, we call that group of offsprings the clone, because they are all the same, the genetic makeup is the same. And usually, these offspring are always of the same sex, because there was no fusion of gametes, implying that if they had been formed from a male organism, all would be males, if female, all would be female. But there is a technical aspect in this, as we are going to see in a short while, that the males are not involved. But we are going to see that mechanism and will explain what actually is happening. In this situation, we see that there is no evolution of species because evolution would have involved the change of genetic material. And this also takes relatively a very short period of time for so many hundreds of offsprings to be produced. If we take binary fission as our example, or the first example, we see that this is so-called bi means two. And this takes place in single cell organisms such as amoeba, paramecium, or planar. During binary fission, these cells, which we, have, we call mother cells, they reproduce asexually. And this is done by the cells simply dividing into two equal halves. And this is called bi, the VI stands for two, binary fission. If this division, however, is into more than two, three, eight, whatever number, then we call it multiple fission. Multiple without a definition means that it can be any number depending on the favorable conditions that have been provided for those cells to divide. For binary fission in amoeba, this is exactly what happens. We have a mother cell, we call it mother in quotes, because it is from this cell that the younger ones shall become or shall generate. This mother cell now divides into two. But it does not just divide at once. What actually happens is that when it is about to divide, then there is a period of growth, meaning that it stores a lot of nutrients, and then the genetic material in the nucleus increases, so that when it is dividing, the two daughter cells shall be the same. And when this genetic material increases, we see that the pseudopodia are pulled in the opposite side of the nucleus, and the nucleus starts to divide into two. When the nucleus divides into two, now the cytoplasm, as it has pulled, the nucleus moves to opposite sides, and then there's a shrinkage in the middle. This shrinkage continues, and eventually there is a split into two. With this, with this shrinkage, the two cells where the nuclei had moved, it splits completely, and we now have two daughter cells. Remember that these two daughter cells are the same like the original parent, because the genetic material is the same. To continue, when the conditions are favorable, and when we talk of favorable conditions, we imply a situation where there is enough nutrients, there is enough moisture, and there is no heat which could destroy the organism. When such conditions are provided or are favorable, then we see that this fission, which could be binary or multiple, it then takes place. And depending on how favorable the conditions were, it could be multiple fission, so that within a short time, from one mother amoeba cell, you can have 50, you can have 100, 300, even thousands. But when that food and moisture becomes scarce, then the other method of reproduction takes place because these cells will not reproduce. They will simply form thick walls around them, as we are going to see in a short while. So here, we have an example of a paramecium, which is also undergoing binary fission. It is in the process. So we see that with time, this indentation is going to cut and it will give rise to two daughter paramecia. 
this an example in pathogenesis. We have a special type of lizard. We are going to talk a little more about this lizard. And I'll give you the name and where it is located. We have been seeing lizards around, but this one has a special way in which it reproduces. We shall do a little more on this. Because we can have, this is the female, and this female doesn't require the male to reproduce. But how does this now take place? This is a vertebrate. So we are going to see that in a short while, and that's the essence of this lesson. Remember, in our real life situation, we are talking about a zoo in Limbe, and what the zoo got observed. We shall come back to that in a short while. But before that, let's look at the types of pathogenesis, because this will help us to explain what has actually happened and what goes on in this special species of lizards. For pathogenesis, we can have natural pathogenesis. And for this natural, it could be complete, what we call obligate pathogenesis, or it could be incomplete, or of course, cyclic pathogenesis. We could also have pedogenetic pathogenesis. We are going to see examples of all of these in due course. In the situation of natural pathogenesis, certain animals which undergo, they constantly live in their specific natural habitats. And these habitats where they find themselves, the conditions permit them to carry out this process. And in this process, there may be two types, complete or incomplete. Remember, when we talk of complete here in the biological sense, we mean that from the mother to the daughter, and that daughter also becoming another mother, and there is no instance where there is diffusion of gametes. That is what we mean by complete. And when there is incomplete, it means that there is some form of alternation of generations. We are also going to see some examples that have that in a short while. Then, for complete pathogenesis, like we have seen, a good example are some insects which have no sexual phase and they do not have males at all and they have to reproduce. So we have complete pathogenesis in this case and they depend exclusively on this for self-reproduction. This is also called obligate or what we call obligatory because if it fails, these insects won't reproduce. And in so doing, it will imply that with time, that species will become extinct. Therefore, what happens? Some of the examples where we have this obligate uh, pathogenesis are in rotifers, or we call sponges. In this special sponge, we call the deloid rotifers, the females reproduce exclusively by pathogenesis, no males. And then in monogonous rotifers, females can alternate between sexual and asexual reproduction, implying that in monogonous, there is a male. So when we talk of sexual, it now implies the fusion of gametes. Then, for Caucasian rock lizard, remember we had talked about the lizard, the Caucasian rock lizard. This lizard from the Caucasian region in the Soviet Union, that's in Russia, reproduces only by pathogenesis. And this is always producing females in the process. There are no males at all. That is why I earlier said that this was a special species of lizard. Then, in incomplete or partial or cyclic pathogenesis, the life cycle is often found in certain insects. And in these insects, there are two generations. There is the sexual phase of the reproductive the reproduction, and then there is the asexual. And in this uh, sexual and pathogenic generations, both alternate with each other before a life cycle is complete. So it's a form of alternation of generation. We are also going to look deeply in alternation of generation, where we shall explore all the four forms, and then we'll see why each occurs where it occurs. For the diploid eggs, these ones will produce the females, but the unfertilized eggs will produce the males. Therefore, in aphids, which is a very common and good example which we have around, many successive generations of females will develop from unfertilized eggs. And this will take place when the conditions are warm. 
like maybe in the dry season in our own case. And if it is in your European setup where you have some uh, winter, summer, and the autumn and spring, this will be in summer where you have good sexes will be formed. And by so doing, like we are going to see in a short while, because we'll look at the detailed life cycle of this uh, orchid, it implies that climatic conditions affect the way the aphids reproduce. For females, during these warm conditions, they will meet with the males and then they will lay fertilized eggs. And these fertilized eggs have the ability to resist and go through the cool winter conditions so that when winter is over, they can then hatch into females the next spring. That's when the conditions have become warmer. We also have another example in honeybee. This is an example here. We see bees around landing on flowers and in hives. But what is special here is that the queen, the queen bee in a particular colony is usually fertilized by the drones during what we call the nuptial flight. When they fly into the sky, they mate, and then these male, which we call the drones, they will put in a lot of sperm into this female. And while inside, these sperm are stored in a pouch and they remain there and they can remain there for throughout the life of this queen. They now will return back, they now will return into the hive, and with time, this, the sperm which have been stored into this pouch, they will keep migrating one after the other with time to fertilize the eggs that are being produced, implying that this female or the queen will continue to lay eggs for a very long period of time without going out for the nuptial flight. But what then actually happens is that we have a queen which is deployed and then we have worker bees which are also deployed and we have the drones which are haploid. And these drones, like we studied in social insects, maybe in our earlier classes, they do not produce anything in the hive. But when they have fertilized the queen, they come and their only function is just to be there. They stay and eventually they die, and other drones are formed. So these fertilized eggs actually will develop into females, which are the queen and the workers. And then the unfertilized eggs will form the male, which are the drone, whose only function is to fertilize the queen once in that queen's lifetime. Therefore, pathogenesis in drones are caused by mitosis, where the gametes are formed by mitosis, imply that the gametes are diploid. In this example, we have broken it down so that we can see what actually happens in the life cycle of the honeybee. We have the queen, which is deployed, the drone, which is haploid, and then meiosis will occur in the queen to produce haploid eggs. We will not have uh, meiosis in the drone, but mitosis to produce haploid sperm, since there's no division or reduction of the genetic material. Then, when fertilization occurs, the male larvae, where there is no fertilization, will form the drones, and where there is fertilization, the larvae will either be the queen or the workers, and these will be deployed. We also have an example in birds, where all the chicks produced from unfertilized eggs are males, and these may be fertile as adults. And if they are fertile, it will imply that all the sperm that are formed are formed by mitosis, implying that there is no reduction in the chromosome number. These are some of the examples, as we shall see in a short while and in subsequent lessons. For diploid pathogenesis, these, or these, the young will develop from unfertilized diploid eggs, implying that they will develop and mature to be diploid. And the types here, we, in, we include amniotic pathogenesis. And during this, the oogenesis, that's the development of the egg, takes place. There is meiosis 1, which does not occur, but meiosis 2 occurs. And in so doing, such eggs are deployed and then develop into new individuals without fertilization. So when this occurs, as we have in weevils, 
and also in long horn grasshoppers, the offspring will continue to be deep like, but it doesn't imply that there was fertilization. Then in meiotic parthenogenesis, the eggs developed by meiosis 1 and meiosis 2, but all the stages, the chromosome number doubles and the diploid number resolves, meaning that after the chromosome number have reduced in meiosis 1 and meiosis 2 to haploid, they still replicate again to become diploid. So this is called meiotic parthenogenesis and such eggs will develop into diploid individuals. We also have another example of pathogenic pathogenesis here, where the larvae of some insects lay eggs, which develop pathogenically into new generation of larvae. This is an example. We see a larva here. See that? If you look keenly here, let me shift the cursor. You see that these are the young ones and the young ones have the same genetic makeup like this mother. But normally, we know that in insects, larvae do not reproduce because the larva is supposed to change into a pupa if it is complete uh, metamorphosis and then to an adult, and it is the adult that lays eggs. But in this special process, you have larvae here that are able to give rise to the young ones. So we actually see that parthenogenesis is a special form of reproduction. This is another example of the whiptail lizard. And in this whiptail lizard, all of them are females. And what happens is that they do not have males in this species at all. When they are to reproduce, you can see some, if you just observe, you may think that they are mating, but there's actually no copulation. What happens is that one of the lizards, the one which is mounting on top, it plays the role of a male, and when it mounts, the one which is below plays the role of a female, but there is no exchange of gametes. What happens is some, the liberation of some hormones, which is called like the pheromones, which uh, sets out a scent, and when this male, male-like, in quote, mounts, it produces the pheromone, which now cause the female, which is below, to react. Its body reacts as if it is a female, and then the eggs which are inside, they begin to develop further. And when they are developing, they will give rise to young ones. Those eggs will hatch. And in the same cycle, when it finishes, the one which was below also mounts the one which was above, and then the same reaction happens. So there's some sort of pheromones that cause a sensation which lead to the development of eggs without actually fertilization, because all of them are females. There is no sperm involved. Then, like we explained in this whip uh, tail lizard, we see that it is so special because some of them can parasitize males from closely related species. Parasitize here is in quotes, it is not a parasite, but implying that they will be acting in related species as if they are males, but they are not males. That is what it means. And also, if they are only within their own species, some of them may decide to play dominant roles, claiming to be only males and to not allow allowing themselves to be mounted so that their own eggs also develop. So parasitize here is contextual in this sense. Also, in artificial uh, pathogenesis, this is performed, could be performed in the laboratory using chemicals or temperature changes. And we have had a lot of experiments maybe by pricking, or like in frog eggs with a needle, and some of them could develop, like in the example that was carried out by Jack Liu. But these studies have not been carried out in humans because of ethical reasons. We also have induction of pathogenesis. This is happening in the lab where you want to actually do it yourself. So we see that the temperature range for it goes between zero to 10 degrees Celsius to 30 degrees Celsius and may induce pathogenesis in eggs of a number of organisms. There could also be electrical shock, which could make the eggs to develop without fertilization, or application of UV light, ultraviolet rays to those eggs. For chemicals, chloroform, we have hypotonic or hypotonic seawater, and many other chemicals in the lab could be used. These are experiments that 
we would ex be expected to carry out so that you also discover a number of issues in the biological field. But what is the significance of this parthenogenesis? It is a means for the determination of sex in honeybees and a supposed chromosome theory of inheritance. And it is the most simple, stable, and easy process of reproduction. Also, it eliminates various forms of population, and then it is a means of high rates of multiplication. This, therefore, could be used in the production of microbes that could be used to produce vaccines or medicines for humans and animals. Also, there is also less waste of energy in the process of mating. So within a short time, so many offsprings are produced, and there is no sterility in any case. Each individual will be able to produce a young one. We go back to our real life situation we had where a zoo guard in Limbe observed that the eggs of a lizard hatch without the male. From our lesson that we have had and the scientific observation, which was that unfertilized eggs have hatched, what then can we say? The hypothesis stated was that in the absence of males, female lizards lay unfertilized eggs that can hatch to young lizards. Has our knowledge proven this? We could keep the following comments based on our lesson that not all lizards reproduce asexually. Some reproduce sexually. And then the guard certainly caught and kept a whip tail lizard in the, in, in the fence and did not provide opportunities for it to come across the male. So for the whip tail like we have had, all female lizards can lay on fertilized eggs, but hatching would depend on the species. That's why we had that special species of the whip tail lizard and the Caucasian lizard. The hypothesis, therefore, would not be supported. We would reject it based on this premise. Here is a short exercise for us to review our brains. If you were given a gene and told that it is a cure for COVID-19 and asked to multiply in a small macroorganism, when we say small macro, it means that it is small, tiny, but made of many cells, then what will you do in relation to parthenogenesis. A plausible response or procedure would be as follows. You could inoculate the genome of the aphids into, into the aphids since aphids multiply faster. And then, and they are also tiny, then you realize that within a very short time, their life cycle would have, they would have been able to reproduce so many aphids by parthenogenesis. And as the young ones are in large numbers, you would then ex extract that gene and use it in the production of your drug. That is how it could be used, using the knowledge of parthenogenesis. With this, it is important that we take on something that we can do later on and do further findings. And the question would be as follows. For you to give one reason in each case to answer the following questions with one reason. One, which method of reproduction produces identical offspring and is most successful in a stable environment. We have the four alternatives of asexual, sexual, conjugation, and inbreeding. We also have the second, which is, which of the following statements is false? We have bonding is a method of sexual reproduction. Fragmentation is a method of asexual reproduction. Parthenogenesis produces diverse offspring. And binary fission is a method of asexual reproduction. And thirdly, and lastly, sea stars are broken apart by workers to save the clams they feed on, and then thrown back into the ocean. But often, the numbers of these sea stars increase. What actually happens? Could it be regeneration? Could it be fragmentation? Could it be body? Or could it be that the presence of the suitable conditions enable sea stars to multiply in large numbers? You will have to do that assignment so that in our next lesson, we shall be able to throw more light on it. Here are some of the references that we were able to consult in preparing this lesson, not exclusive. And with that, we have come to the end of our lesson. Our next lesson shall be on concepts of sexual reproduction. <laughs> Ona tege minga matege nyum Ona tege majang matege ndom Mane tambia ninya ne njubia yen Ngani bana matege mut Ngani lakiri watege ndong Yeso tinambia jinkido Mane tambia ninya ne njubia yen 
Tam tama mote tam zabike Tam tama tonge tam zabike Tam tam tama mote tam zabike Mane tambia ninyane injubia yen